Most people have to go to an office every day. And so these companies, they build offices. And they expect their employees to come to that location every day to do great work. It seems like it's perfectly reasonable to, to ask that. However, if you actually talk to people and even question yourself, and you ask yourself, where do you really want to go when you really need to get something done? You almost never hear someone say the office. But businesses are spending all this money on this place called the office, and they're making people go to it all the time, yet people don't do work in the office. What is that about? Like, why is that? Why is that happening? Maybe it's the latest business fad Or a philosophy you've always had But there's a little doubt that lurks Does that even work? Does that even work? In this episode, Offices. Does that even work? Offices. They're like prison with Wi-Fi and without the beds. There's a reason the expression exists, chained to my desk. Part of what I've been doing for the last 20 years is helping companies improve, and that includes culture change and productivity coaching. I remember talking to an architect once, and he designed his offices so that the corridors, the hallways, could fit three people walking abreast. That way, people could walk and talk. They could use their traveling time between meetings more productively. I thought that was a genius idea. This is Does That Even Work? a podcast for leaders and executives who want to improve their businesses. It questions the latest business fads and maybe philosophies you've always had and asks, does that even work? I'm your host, Eric VG. I wondered where this idea of designing offices to improve productivity even came from, and does it even work? And I was lucky enough to chat to a former academic called Claire Roussel. We'll also be hearing from Herman Miller, the company that invented the corporate prison cell, also known as The Cubicle, back in 1968. You'll hear how much money that idea has made them in the last 50 years, and they have a new system called The Living Office. When I first heard the term, I thought it was a new way of defining the corporate jungle. I had visions of trees inside and dense foliage, or maybe it was a way of getting you to live in the office, you know, the living office, make the office a bit more like prison with Wi-Fi desks and now beds. But it's very different from all of that. We've already heard from Jason Fried. We opened the show with his TED Talk. We'll be hearing his three tips to make offices more productive. And just for fun, I asked a comedian, Josh Murphy, to poke fun at offices. It's a packed show today, so keep listening. But first I asked former academic Claire Roussel, where does this idea come from that you can design space to be more productive? And she says it comes from a 20th century movement called modernism. You're telling me about the living office and it makes me think about the modernists and this idea that through good design you could improve society you could improve the moral fiber of the people that would be using the design and you could make the world a better place and what sparked the modernist movement so so modernists oh, they're so interesting so they had a look at industrialization of the 1800s and they were like this is a terrible way to live and people are suffering people are sick in factories it's awful um and towards the end of the 1800s you have the machine comes becomes a much stronger force in um in industry and so the modernists saw the potential for the machine to automate a lot of jobs um so to free up people um, and make things of better quality and, and change society. So they really embraced this kind of technical revolution that was happening at the end of the 1800s. So I guess this whole idea of the living office, so, well, let me put it another way, the modernists, can you talk to me about the human-centeredness of their, of their vision? So they really felt that they could improve people's lives through design. And... But still, it's centered around them improving other people's lives through design. And so who were they? Well, they were majority a bunch of white European guys, um, middle to upper class, um, who were deciding what was best for the masses. And and even calling people the masses, you know, you you should start worrying. 
yeah, so you have this small group of people who on some level are well-meaning, but who are making decisions and moral judgments of how other people live and should live. And that, and through their design, imposing a way of being on other people. So who are these people, architects and industrial designers? Hmm. These views of changing society through design in this particular way kind of did pool up around the architects and industrial designers. I mean, modernism is also many things. So in a lot of ways, it was emancipatory. And it was, it was really changing the way that people do things and in a very radical, never seen before kind of way. So they were also the people who were pushing for a far more egalitarian society. They were, they were radical in their, in their own spheres. So Give me an example of a modernist design. Like, are there toasters? There are, and a lot of them we still use. Okay, so an example of modernist design is those stacking chairs, that, those moulded stacking chairs at schools. They're usually grey plastic with tubular metal for the legs. Um, you've, I would assure you that you and everyone listening to this have sat in one. And that comes directly out of modernism. What makes a stacking chair a modernist design? So there's a kind of economy of means, um, how to do, how to make something functional. So form follows function, right? So that's we know that that's to do with modernism. That is the slogan of modernism: is form follows function. So um, so designing. So you, the function is we need to people to be able to sit, but we also need to put the chairs far away so they don't take up the space all the time. How do we do that in the simplest? most economical way to do. What's the moral element then of modernism? What's the philosophy driving it? One of the philosophies driving modernism is efficiency. And so how do we most efficiently use those materials and that space for putting the most people in it? For example, in the, with the example of the stacking chairs. And so from what I've told you about the living office, how does modernism tie into that? Yeah, so it seems to me the similarity is that is this idea that design can change the way we do things and and how we act. And in some ways it does um, because it determines how we navigate space and what we do with our hands when we're in that space and what, how we work with our bodies in that space. But in other ways it doesn't. I don't know if any of you have bought a a fancy a fancy journal or a fancy diary that is is suddenly going to change the way that you um, you live and meet with people and operate and and you did the first two pages of it but if it's not actually how you operate design is not going to change that my my example is I was always looking for my keys and the irritating thing was I had a place to put the keys the top of the piano was the place I put my keys and I never put my keys on top of the piano, even though I had designated the place on top of the piano to put my keys. And somebody said to me, when you walk in the house, are your keys in your left hand or your right hand? I said, my keys are in my right hand. And she said, and what side is the piano? <laughs> the piano's on the left. Well, you're going to reach for something on the right-hand side of you, not on the left-hand side of you, because that's where your keys are. So it doesn't really matter that you've designated the space. That that's where the keys go find a space on the other side that you can designate and then make your keys go there because that's where you put the keys actually and this brings us to a company called herman miller they are an office furniture supply company and they actually invented the cubicle back in 1968 and they called it the action office so they've always been good at coming up with catchy names for their products and Scott Adams, the Dilbert cartoonist, has made it his career to mock the idea of the cubicle farm. And in their defense, they were very insistent that you should never put people into boxes. So for a long time, they refused to manufacture a right-angled bracket for their action office system. But companies wanted to squeeze more people into less space, so eventually Herman Miller relented. We'll hear just how much money that idea was worth later in the podcast. I spoke to Oliver Baxter, who is the Insight Program Manager at Herman Miller, that basically means he talks to clients about the research that Herman Miller continually does into office design. He's a Brit based in Dubai, 
and he looks after the Middle East and Pacific countries. He's an interesting guy. He started out as a graduate psychologist and he landed up working for a coaching business in Norway. He says his typical client was a woman who came in with burnout and he, she would come in to become unburned out. And Oliver would give him the skills to cope with the work and life. And he says it was really quite frustrating. These people would come in over and over again and he would send them back out into a toxic environment, an environment so toxic that Gallup, the polling organization, says only 15% of employees are actively engaged at work. That's around one in seven. And 16%, that's about one in six, are actively disengaged. So one in seven people are doing their best to further the company's aims, and slightly more are either doing nothing at all or sabotaging their efforts. So Oliver Baxter wondered if there was any way he could change that. Could you design an office to increase engagement? It's a modernist idea, and here is my conversation with him. And we've all worked with colleagues and employees and businesses that are actively disengaged, that come up to work every day to, you know, stir the pot, to, to slack off, to be on social media all day, to just not do their job. They're incredibly demotivated. But unfortunately today, the average of actively disengaged is higher than the percentage of engaged employees. That's terrifying. How does Herman Miller go about solving that problem? Well, the first thing is, is to be honest with people and to explain that buying Herman Miller furniture is not going to get you to 100% engagement. It is a contributing factor. Let me tell you what some of the largest effects can be had in, in different elements. So interior design, small effect. Management, massive effect. Uh, according to Gallup, um, up to 70% of engagement um, is, is held in whether you have a good manager or not. And Jason Fried, the TED Talk guy at the beginning of the show, agrees completely. Listen to what he has to say about managers. The real problems are what I like to call the M&Ms, the managers and the meetings. Those are the real problems in the modern office today. And this is why things don't get done at work. It's because of the M&Ms. Now, what's interesting is if you listen to all the places that people talk about doing work, like at home or in the car or on a plane or late at night or early in the morning, you don't find managers in meetings. You find a lot of other distractions, but you don't find managers in meetings. So these are the things that you don't find elsewhere, but you do find at the office. And managers are basically people whose job it is is to interrupt people. That's pretty much what managers are for. They're for interrupting people. They don't really do the work, so they have to make sure everyone else is doing the work, which is an interruption. Okay, so how does Herman Miller or Office Design solve that problem? So a good boss uh, can really affect that either positively or negatively by about a 70% sway. Um, another element, and this is something that people in the C-suite and CD managers really don't want to acknowledge or, or like to admit in many different instances, but know at a, at a core level, is that actually just allowing your employees to work from home for one day a week will give you a 20% spike in engagement overnight. 20% spike in engagement, just from allowing people more flexibility in their lives. <laughs> okay. And do I have to have a Herman Miller furniture in my home office to get that spike? <laughs> no, not necessarily. It's just that you know, a lot of people are really distracted and interrupted in the workplace. Um, for many organizations, they believe that just giving someone access to a workstation is sufficient enough for them to do their job. And it's not, because... From the research that we've observed, about 70% of collaboration happens at the edge of people's desks, which is incredibly distractive for the people who are not involved in that collaborative um, session. And it also interrupts the person who might not necessarily have got the scheduled email that we're having a meeting. It could just be an impromptu, all right, I can see that person over there, let's go and say hello, do you have a quick second? Yes, great, I'm going to sit on the edge of your desk and we're going to have a collaborative session. And the problem with that is people trying to work when they're at their workstation. So this is actually making the working day longer because people can't get into that state of flow. And again, this is kind of sporting terminology. They can't get into that state of flow for long enough to pump out you know, productive, high-performing work. Um, so uh, imagine you are in a state of flow you know, at your desk, at your laptop. You know, the work is just flowing easily. The words are coming to you. you, you know, you're, you're ticking things off your checklist. And then a colleague 
who's well-intended and well-meaning comes up to you and goes, I'm sorry, can I just pick your brains for a second? And because you're a good person, you kind of grit your teeth and go, yes, okay, can you make this quick? They sit on the edge of your workstation, they invade your space, and you end up having a collaborative uh, conversation. Now, when that person leaves, it's going to take, on average, 23 minutes for you to get back into that state of flow again. So how does good design help prevent those impromptu collaborations that happen 70% of the time at the edge of someone's desk? Ultimately, a desk, if you've got really difficult, fine-focused work to do, is not ideal. You actually need a private office space to access for that period that you are doing fine-focused, heads-down, dedicated work. But you're not doing them all day. You also need to connect and engage with your peers and colleagues. So that's where the workstation comes in. So that's one way where you can stop yourself being distracted when, when you need to do complicated tasks. Another element to stop this invasion of space and people sat on the edge of your desk is to create what we call cove environments, impromptu collaborative spaces that are in close proximity to where the workstation is. Yeah, you were showcasing those uh, cove environments in Johannesburg, and I must say I was very impressed. They're comfortable, they're easy to use, they're designed so you can see everyone in the informal gathering. There was a whiteboard and you can project your laptop screen in case you need it. And there was even a pin board. They were great. Another thing you were telling me, Oliver, there was some research you did at a firm in Scotland. Tell me what you found there. Well, in the case of this um, uh, Glasgow client uh, in, in Scotland, in the north of the UK, um, these are some of the questions that we asked before the move and then after the move, and we'll see kind of the, the performance in the season and the increases that happened um, as a result of the, the intervention in, in terms of their interior design that we call the living office. So they asked, um, does your workplace uh, facilitate your productivity? And before the positive response to that was around about 50%. After the move, that jumped to a whopping 83% in their new living office environment. Uh, in terms of the questioning around comfort, 43% agreed with the statement that our workplace um, was functional and comfortable uh, before the move. And then after the move, again, 89% agreed with the statement that our workplace was functional and comfortable. Okay, so before the move, half the people said the office was productive and 40%, two in five, said it was comfortable. And after the move, the answers to both of those questions went up to 85 90%. How much do you think that is simply, okay, we've got new chairs, we feel better, rather than a functional change in the configuration? Yeah, I mean, that is, there's the perception and then there's reality, isn't there? So we, we worked with Dr. Paul Zach on an experiment. We took blood samples, we took uh, heart rate, uh, galvanic skin response measures, which is basically how much you perspire, sweat, um, and ECG results as well. So all of these things triangulated together we get a good idea of where are the best spaces in a workplace for reducing stress, building trust, and for creativity and problem solving. Wow, so you, you monitored people's heart rates and how much they sweated. Wow. And what did you find was the least stressful work environment? What was it, the bathroom? Yeah, <laughs> not far off, actually. That, that's more linked with creativity. Okay, so we've talked about desks and chairs and bathrooms. Where else do people work? So a desk in a chair is one setting. A pantry is one setting. Uh, a cove, that impromptu collaboration space, is another setting. A meeting space is one setting. A private office is one setting. There are about 10 different settings that we identify that most organizations need, but we only know what they require when we go into those businesses, find out what their people do for activities, and then we can provide them with the settings to do it within. And that was the idea behind the cubicle. You know, it was never supposed to put people into boxes. Because Herbert Villa, we actually developed the action office system, which then became synonymous with the cubicle. For a long time, we didn't even you know, um, uh, manufacture a 90-degree bracket because we, we said categorically, don't ever put people into boxes. If you look at any of the literature around that time, in 1968, to accompany the action office um, portfolio, we also published a book, a uh, research manifesto called A Facility Based on Change that said categorically never put people into boxes. This system was designed for flexibility. So the, now saying that, we, we've done over about $9 billion in that product since its creation in nine, 1968. And I think we just need to remember why we have offices in the first place. It's not for cost reduction, it's for value add. The whole idea of an office space is to augment the performance of the people within it, not to give them the minimum that they require 
to to do the maximum of our job. Okay, let's leave my conversation with Oliver Baxter there. We'll come back to him in a moment. The idea that you can design space to influence human behavior is a modernist idea, and it does work to a certain extent, except that people are people, and they will do what they do. For example, I designed a space to put my keys in when I got home, but I never used it because it turns out my human nature meant I wanted to put my keys on the left-hand side and not the right-hand side. Designing more productive space is important because engagement levels are very low, only 15%. Uh, Baxter says you can get a 20% increase in engagement by simply letting people work from home one day a week. He went on to say that Herman Miller has done a survey with a firm in Scotland which indicates that people's perception of the productivity and comfort of their office goes from 40 or 50 percent to 85 or 90 percent after the office space has been reconfigured. They even measured people's heart rates and oxytocin levels and how much people sweat to find out which environments are actually less stressful, not just from a perception point of view, but which environments work best for people. And they found that a desk and a chair is just as productive as what he calls a pantry, which is basically an in-house coffee shop environment. And then he talked about 10 different settings, he called them, places where people do work. A private office is good for work that needs uninterrupted time and a flow state. Other settings include what he calls a cove, which is an impromptu meeting space or a meeting room or a coffee shop environment. He says the noise level doesn't matter in those places. What makes them productive is that there aren't as many interruptions, which goes back to Jason Fried's slightly tongue-in-cheek point that a manager's job is to interrupt people. Jason Fried has some concrete ideas about how to make the office more productive, and then we'll hear from Oliver Baxter again, and then some comedy to round things off. So meetings and managers are two major problems in businesses today, especially in offices. These things don't exist outside of the office. I have three suggestions I'll share with you guys. How about no talk Thursdays? How about <laughs> pick one third, just one Thursday once a month and cut that day in half and just say the afternoon. I'll make it really easy for you. So just the afternoon, one Thursday, the first Thursday of the month, just the afternoon, nobody in the office can talk to each other. Just silence. That's it. And what you'll find is that a tremendous amount of work actually gets done when no one talks to each other. This is when people actually get stuff done, is when no one's bothering them and no one's interrupting them. And you can give someone, like giving someone four hours of uninterrupted time is the best gift you can give anybody at work. Another thing you can try is switching from active communication and collaboration, which is like face-to-face -face stuff, tapping people on the shoulder, saying hi to them, having meetings, and replace that with more passive models of communication, using things like email and instant messaging or collaboration products, things like that. Now, some people might say email is really distracting, and IM is really distracting, and these other things are really distracting, but they're distracting at a time of your own choice and your own choosing. You can quit the email app. You can't quit your boss. You can quit IM. You can't hide your manager. Right? You can put these things away, and then you can be interrupted on your own schedule, at your own time, when you're available, when you're ready to go again, because work like sleep happens in phases. So you're going to be kind of going up and doing some work, and then you're going to come down from that work, and then maybe it's time to check that email, check that IM. So if you're a manager, start encouraging people to use more things like IM and email and other things that someone else can put away, and they can get back to you on their own schedule. And the last suggestion I have um, is that if you do have a meeting coming up, if you, are, if you have the power, just cancel it. Just cancel that next meeting. <laughs> When, today's Friday, so Monday, usually people have meetings on Monday, just don't have it. Now, I don't mean like move it. I mean just erase it from memory, it's gone, and you'll find out that everything will be just fine. Like, all these discussions and de decisions you thought you had to make at this one time at 9 a.m. on Monday, just forget about them and things will be just fine. People have a more open morning, they can actually think, and you'll find out that maybe all these things you thought you had to do, you don't actually have to do. What Jason Fried and Oliver Baxter are both saying is that you can make offices more productive. One, by using clever design, and the other, by using policies and procedures. The problem is that most people think that to make an office more productive, you need to make it cheaper. If you can cram more people into an office, then you're paying less per square foot or square meter. In 2010, the average space allocated to a person was 225 square feet, or about 23 square meters. 
In 2013, that was down to 176 square feet, or 16 square meters. Okay, that's a long time ago, but still, that's a 20% reduction. And the bean counters are saying, great, that means we're paying 20% less rent, and rent is expensive. But the numbers don't add up, do they? In one article in Fast Company, they made the following case. Even if you're in an expensive location, say Seattle or New York, you can remove the highly productive private offices and replace them with an open plan system, which takes even less space than cubicles. And you can save, say, $170 on office space per year. That's not nothing. That's real money. But at what cost? If your salary bill for the business is $5 million, then a tiny drop in productivity, say 3 or 4%, destroys any savings you make. On a $5 million salary bill, that's $350,000. You're spending $350,000 to save $170,000. That's nuts. You're losing $180,000 a year because you're saving money on office space. You can read the article for yourself. I'll provide a link in the show notes. It was from Fast Company. In a moment, you'll hear Oliver Baxter tell us that after they implement a cleverly designed office, they see a boost in productivity of 7% on average. Yes. So um, from the impartial third-party adjudicators, that is the Leesman Index, uh, measuring before, during, and after the intervention of interiors that we call the living office, We've identified that on average, and this was across an analysis of about eight clients from uh, around the world, uh, that the indices in terms of engagement went up 7% on average. So when I'm speaking to you know, the C-suite or the CEO of an organization, I can let them know what to expect in terms of the ROIs from engaging with this process that we call the living office. Um, now, I don't want you know, the listeners just to take my word for it, obviously. Um, you know, I could say anything. So what, what I'll do uh, is I'll provide you with a couple of documents that we could include in the notes where people are able to access and download some of these research statistics themselves and kind of critique them and then come back with any questions um, should they have anything from, uh, from the podcast that we've done today, Eric. Reflecting on what we've learned, it ties back to design thinking. The approach that Oliver Baxter and Jason Fried are both taking is to observe how people actually get things done and design offices and environments that help people do that. And if you want to hear more about design thinking, listen to our episode about design thinking is bullshit at doesitevenwork.com. We spend a lot of time at the office. It's a place we all love to hate and none more than comedian Josh Murphy. Here is his take on offices. You know what I love about the office? The free coffee. But they really wanted me to work harder and faster. They could just set out some lines of cocaine, though. I'll tell you what I don't love about the office. All staff meetings. They stuff 75 people in a room built for 50. And the first 50 people to take their seats get to keep their jobs. Why don't you just handcuff me to Rachel, my least favorite colleague, put us in the kitchen while Bob reheats his smoked fish sandwich for the third time this week. This little tiny kitchen, just a microwave and a sink. Note on the side, this is not a self-cleaning kitchen. Thanks, the management. How about how passive aggressive is that? Elon Musk says you should leave meetings that aren't productive. The man's a genius. What's with people talking on the phone in the toilet at work? Forget about even talking in the bathroom at all. It's awkward enough. So I come in the bathroom, someone's on the toilet, on the phone. I want to scream, he's sitting on the toilet talking to you at work. There's a great David Sedaris joke. When David calls up his sister, she's always says she's in the kitchen opening a jar of pickles. That was Does That Even Work? A podcast that challenges conventional wisdom and the latest fads and the things we do all the time with one simple question. Does that even work? I'm Eric BG. If you want to learn more about our productivity consulting or design thinking workshops, please contact us at the link in the show notes or at strativation.com. I'll be providing links to Herman Miller's Living Office, the surveys that they did with Gensler, with, uh, I'll be providing links to Jason Fried's TEDx talk, and of course to comedian Josh Murphy. You can find our episodes on innovation, strategy, and coaching at doesthatevenwork.com. 
For upcoming episodes, we want to look at talent management and even meetings. Jason Fried says meetings are not productive, but do they even work? Subscribe to the podcast to find out. And if you've got something you want us to look at, please email ideas at doesthatevenwork.com. Until next time, don't believe everything you read or hear. Ask yourself, does that even work? He's sitting on the toilet talking to you at work. <laughs>